family is different. Maybe you're thinking right now that as you've been stuck in your house for your, with your family for a little bit longer than usual, yeah, my family is really different. But truth is, every family is different. Every family comes from somewhere different. You know, we bring into our families all kinds of different culture, understandings, sayings, that maybe someone down the road has very different ones of. You know, maybe you've come from a culture, maybe from a different country, and you bring those characteristics to your family, and it makes it unique, and it makes it your family. And as you grew up, maybe you learned some sayings or some characteristics of your parents that you didn't realize you were adapting into your own life, but they became part of you. I know in my family, there were a variety of things that kind of became part of us kids growing up there. I know my dad had a whole lot of sayings. And some of these sayings, I always wondered, did they come from the movie Godfather or not? Because it seemed like an awful lot of them actually did. But one of the sayings that he had, my dad, was that there are two things guaranteed in life. Death and taxes. That no matter what, every single one of us is going to be facing them. And as our tax season has been prolonged a little bit, so we have some more time to file, it's an absolute truth that we're still going to have to file them. The reality is, yeah, every single one of us faces death at some point in our life and taxes. We can't avoid it. And while those two things are definitely unavoidable, I think there's actually two other constants, two other guarantees in life that are absolutely even more importantly unavoidable that we all face. And these two guarantees, I would say, are God, God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, the God who does not change, the God who created the universe, who is the same God who inspired people long ago to follow him, to be a blessing to the world, who spoke through prophets to guide people towards himself, who came in Jesus so that we could have life in all of its fullness, experience the forgiveness of sins, and renew our lives to what it's always been meant to be. And it's the same God who meets us daily as we worship him through songs and prayers and reading scripture and encounters us through the Holy Spirit. That God is a guarantee in life. There is no escaping God. And in fact, God is unchanging. So like I said, he's the same yesterday as he is today, and he will be forever. That is one of the guarantees, one of the constants in life, God. And the other constant in life is change. And while God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and forever, change is absolutely different yesterday, today, and forever. Change is forever changing. Some of you can think back to 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, and you look at the world around you and you go, wow, it has changed. I can remember as a kid not having the internet. Scary thought. I can remember as a kid having one of those TVs that you actually had to turn the knobs on. And I'm not that old. I can remember not having a computer or even a VCR. And some of you are wondering, what's a VCR? That's how constant change is. It is inevitable. It is always happening. And change isn't always easy, though. For some of us, we really don't like change. Some of us, we would rather never change if we could. Some of us are scared of it. In a lot of the reading that I do around leadership and, and management and different things like that, when it comes to change, usually there's about five categories of people in how they approach it. The first category are those who are very pro-change. Change. We call them like the pioneers. People who embrace change, people who seek it out, people who get excited about change. They just can't wait to try something new. They might be the ones who are constantly trying out new restaurants, or maybe the ones who are constantly thinking, how could we adapt our house to better fit our needs? Or maybe the ones in the office who are always saying, hey, why don't we try this? For some of us, we are those people. We love change. I think I'm one of them. We love trying new things. We're okay if it doesn't work out. We just like to try. And those of us who are not like that, 
We can't stand people like this. They drive us nuts. Why can't you just keep things the way they were, we might say. Or, I'm really tired of trying something new. There aren't many people who would fit in this category of pioneer, but I know some of them, and like I said, I think I am one of them. And we just love to try new things. Another category that happens is more of the, not necessarily the ones who will seek out that change, but they're okay with it. They're cool with it. They'll change because they're asked to. They're kind of the yes people. It's a portion of the population, and maybe you're part of this, this group, who aren't looking to change things, but when they're asked to do something different, they're okay with it. They're not going to fight it. Maybe it's in your office and someone says, hey, why don't we try doing it this way? Try this new filing system. And you're not for it, you're not seeking it out, you don't really want it to happen, but you're okay with it. You don't feel so attached to the old way of doing it that you would fight it. It's a person who maybe won't say, let's try that new restaurant out, but when they're invited to it, they're not going to be like, oh, I prefer McDonald's. Some of us go with change. We are yes people, we're okay with it. And that's a portion of us, and maybe you're like that. Maybe you're like that, you like to be invited into change. You're not going to seek it out, but you like to be invited into it and you just go with it. The majority of us, though, are probably something a little different. We're kind of the followers of the crowd. We're the ones who kind of wait and see how things are going. We're not against change. We're not seeking it out. But we just want to see how it's working. So maybe it's in your office and everybody goes to lunch together once a week and some of them have been going, hey, let's, why don't we try it? this restaurant. And you're like, well, I'll wait until they come back a few times and talk about how great it is. And you're like, yeah, let's go. Or maybe it's the one who doesn't really want to try that new car out because you're happy with the car you have. So you wait a while, you wait a while, you see some reports, you chest it out and you go, okay, yeah, let's, let's go for that. You're not against change. You're not seeking it out, but you just wait and see and go, okay, let's do it. Most people estimate that somewhere between 60 and 80% of the population would fit into this category. I know it's a big discrepancy, but it's a lot of people. People who aren't overly excited, people who aren't overly negative, and they just go with it in time. They just want to wait and see. You might be one of those people. Now the fourth category are those who are more reluctant. We start to get into the more reluctant category. We would call this group the skeptics. They aren't against change per se, but they're not really for it either. They want to test. They want to test everything out. They want to make sure that it's the best choice it can be. These are the individuals who will read every report possible on a new car, a new phone, a new whatever, to make sure it is absolutely worth the change. These people aren't bad people. These people aren't great people either. They're just people but people who want to make sure they're making the right choice. Maybe you're one of these people. Maybe you're one of those people who you've seen a lot of change happen and you're very skeptical about it. You, you just want to make sure it's the right thing. You're not against it, but you want to find out all the facts, do all the analysis you can and go, okay, let's do it. And the thing is, once you've done all those fact-finding operations and you've done the analysis, you buy in. You're all for it. You join in on that change until the next time when you got to go through the same process and go, okay, is this really the right choice to make? So these are when you start to get more skeptical. Those who maybe are not so quick to do anything around change. And the last category are the ones who are really against change. And let's call them cave people. Now, I know you might be thinking, okay, like cavemen and women, they've got you know, clubs and they're carrying around like uh, skin clothing stuff from animals. And that's not really what I mean with the cave people. Cave people is actually an acronym from that I got in one of the articles I read. And these are what it, the acronym stands for is citizens against virtually everything. So these are people who will not change or will fight it as best they can for the entirety of their life. Think of the Amish. And I don't know any Amish people personally, and I'm sure they're wonderful people. Chances are they're never going to see this because they've chosen to live a lifestyle that really moves away from technology, from doing things different, and tries to just do things the way they've 
always been done in their mind. Some of us are like this, maybe not as extreme as the Amish, but maybe we still have that TV at home that we have to rotate the dial to get the channels. Or maybe we still have a rotary phone. Maybe we've chosen to say like, you know, computers are bad, so I'm never going to have a computer. Maybe we've chosen to say, well, you know what? I've seen other people change and I just don't like it. I want things the way they always were. You still have your eight track cassettes. That's all you listen to for music. You're against the idea of a streaming service. You don't even know what that means. You just don't like change. And I have gotta be honest with you, I don't think any of you watching this will fit into that category. You might be thinking, well, I hate change. I would never change if I never had to. But the truth is, we've all changed. And the fact that you're watching this has meant that you've adapted in some way because this is the only option you have, maybe. Those of us who hate change sometimes fail to realize that we are constantly changing anyway. And like I said, if we look back 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, you can look back and see how different things are now in your life than they were then. Some good, some bad. Change is constant. And when we experience a time in our lives like now, when we're faced with a virus like COVID-19, it just accelerates change to a degree maybe we were never ready for. But the truth is, ready or not, change will hit us and change will happen. We cannot avoid it. So the question becomes, not how do you avoid change or how do you make change happen? But the question is, how do we approach it? Because change is unavoidable and ready or not, it will hit us. We will face change. And like I said, sometimes it's a lot faster than what we'd like. So what do you do? How do you, how do I, how do we face change? change? Well, a lot of it has to do with perspective. And I really believe this. I really believe that a lot of things in life just depend on our attitude. If we are constantly thinking change is a bad thing, chances are we will not be ready for when change does hit us and we will be reluctant, even aggressively reluctant, angry about it when we have to face it. But the truth is, as constant as God is, God has designed us to change. In fact, it comes up over and over again in Scripture. We are not meant to stay the same. One of the key teachings of the New Testament is that we become new when we become followers of Jesus. We are a new creation. That means change. So our perspective on change needs to shift Moving away from thinking maybe the things that are around us, like how buildings are going up or technology or anything like that, but to the reality that the God who is constant, who is in control, is also the God who invites us to change. Change is guaranteed, but what's not guaranteed is how you and I are going to face it. So when we encounter change, what do we do? I think some of the best wisdom I've seen in this is actually from the book of Ecclesiastes. And now, some of you might be familiar with Ecclesiastes, some of you maybe not. Maybe you, it's not a book that I really preach on very much. It's not part of the scriptures that I really emphasize. And I think part of that is because I misunderstood it for a really long time. But for those of you who aren't familiar with Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes is in our Old Testament. It's part of the Jewish wisdom literature. In particular, this one was written by King Solomon, who was given, uh, asked by God, what do you want? And he asked for wisdom. And because he asked for wisdom, he became known as the wisest person in Israel's history and became one of the most powerful and rich rulers of their time. Now, he wasn't always someone who made the right choices. If you read through his story through scripture, you know he made some very poor choices, especially near the end of his life. But as he wrote down some of his wisdom literature found in places like Proverbs, Song of Solomon, or Ecclesiastes, we are richly blessed to read it. Because there's great insight in what it means to be human and how to deal with all the stuff we encounter every day. And Ecclesiastes is one of those writings 
that's about how do we be human in our world. And like I said, for a long time I misunderstood it. For a long time I thought it was just incredibly negative. Maybe it had to do with where I was at. Maybe it had to do with the reality that I was struggling with negativity in my life. But as I've come to realize over the last few years that there's actually some great insight in this writing that is actually incredibly positive. But sometimes you need to take the time to read through it and understand some of the words that get used. In Ecclesiastes, one of the common words that gets used is meaningless. And when I hear the word meaningless, well, I think meaningless. Like it's worth nothing. It means nothing. It's not good. But the word meaningless that gets translated for us as meaningless doesn't really mean that. The word meaningless is more of a word picture. So the word that gets used in Hebrew actually means mist. Think about mist. You know, when I think about mist, I think about walking along that boardwalk at Niagara Falls. When you walk along, you see the falls, and you see that mist that sprays out, it makes a rainbow in the sky, and it hits your face, it cools off, it's wonderful. But now imagine that mist and trying to grab it. What happens? Well, maybe your hand's a little wet, but there's nothing there. The author of Ecclesiastes says everything is missed. If you chase after it, if you try to grab it, you're really going to be left holding nothing. It's not that it's meaningless, it's just that it won't last. And the only thing that will last is God. And so as the author of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, writes this down, as they write it down to try and help people like you and me understand what really matters in life, what our purpose in life is, and how we should approach it, we come to a spot in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And this section in Ecclesiastes is, is somewhat well known. There was a band in the 70s called The Birds who wrote a song called Turn, Turn, Turn. It's actually basically ripping off the Bible. It's a wonderful song, though. I remember when I was a kid, we used to see those uh, infomercials about, you know, songs of the 70s, and they'd always have this song playing in it. Maybe it's a song that you love. Well, this is where it comes from. It comes from Ecclesiastes. So in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Solomon the author writes this. He says, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. So he's setting it out clear. There is a time for everything. Think about that. There is a time for everything. Think about your life. Think about what you've experienced. Maybe good, maybe bad. Think about what we're experiencing right now with social isolation, a virus that we don't know a lot about. The author is saying there is a time for everything and a season for every activity. Meaning everything we experience in life, good and bad, occurs for a time, a season. It isn't going to be forever, but it will happen. Change is inevitable. Things are inevitable, good or bad. And there's a time, a season for everything. Sometimes when we're feeling discouraged, feeling like this is going on forever, we don't know what to do, like how does my life get better than this? And everything is horrible. We need to remember that there's a time for everything and there's a season for every activity. It's not going to be forever. It doesn't have to be. And our attitude towards it makes all the difference. Then the author goes on to describe what some of these times and seasons are. He starts to go, he says, there's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. And you might add, a time for social distancing and a time to be close together. A time to wear a mask and a time not to. A time to wash your hands, which is always. There's no one off on that. 
But the author is saying, hey, there's a time for everything. Everything we experience has its time, has its place, it occurs. We can't escape it. He's not saying one is good and one is bad. He's saying there is a time. We look at it and we think, well, a time to love, a time to hate. I thought we're supposed to love all the time. Absolutely, we're supposed to love everyone in the way that Jesus loves us. But it doesn't mean there aren't going to be times where people hate you or you feel that way. I'm not saying you should. I'm saying it's reality. And that's what the author is saying. He's not saying one is better than the other. He's not saying you should do this and you shouldn't do that. He's just saying these things happen. This is life. Through life, there are all kinds of things that are always going to be happening. There's always change. It is a constant. We cannot avoid it. There is nothing we can do to change that. But the author is going to continue. He says in verse 9, What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. So what do people get from all their work? This is a question that comes up over and over again in actually Ecclesiastes. Solomon is constantly asking, why do you work so hard? What do you gain from it? He says, I've seen the burden that God's put on us. Yes, God, and I wouldn't necessarily say burden is necessarily a negative thing here. He's saying the reality is God has made us to work. If we go back through Scripture, if we go back to the, through the Old Testament, we hit Genesis 3 where we see what happens when human beings choose to go a different way than God. They disobey God. They sin. God says, hey, the reality is because you've done this, you're going to do certain things you were never meant to do. One of those things is work the earth. You are going to toil. And so the author says, hey, I've seen this burden that God's put on us. We have to work. Things are not perfect. They say, well, what do people gain from this? You know, what, what are they gaining from their toil? He says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. These aren't divorced statements. What do people gain from their toil? He says, I've seen the burden God has laid on every human, on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. There is seasons, there is times for everything. And guess what? It's all beautiful. But how? You might be asking. How can that be beautiful? There are bad things in the world. How is it beautiful? All the change we experience is something in the realm of God. The God who doesn't change is overseer, is God of all the change we experience. Nothing surprises this God. So we might be thinking, well, what about the horrors that we see in the world? Well, it doesn't surprise God. It doesn't mean that God's happy about it. it. doesn't mean that God is happy to know that people are abusing people or creating injustice systems or having being slave traders or, or human traffickers. God isn't happy about those things, but it doesn't surprise God. So we have to keep in this text because there's going to be a point that the author makes about these kind of things. Everything is beautiful in the sense it is orderly. It is the way God has meant it, in a sense. Designed it to be. There's a time for everything. doesn't mean everything is good. In fact, it invites us who see the bad to make a difference in it. But the author is going to continue. He has set, he has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. God has given us this gift to understand him just at a glimpse of the God who is forever, the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we can't fully get it. We have it in our hearts, but we can't fully get it. We can't fully understand God, and that's okay. But the truth is that as we grow, as we change, we understand them a little bit more and more. So we look at something like this in Ecclesiastes, and for me it used to be, wow, this is really depressing. But now I see a lot of hope in this, a lot of truth, a lot of love, because that's the change that's happening in me, that's occurred because of the God who doesn't change. It says, I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in their toil. This is the gift 
of God. When I used to read this, I used to think that he would be saying, oh, it's such a waste to eat or drink or enjoy life. But no, he's actually saying that's the good part. Change is constant. It's always going to be happening. It's not going to be easy. There are good things and there are bad things. But enjoy life. That is a gift from God. How do you approach change? How do you deal with change? First, you have a perspective and understand that change is going to happen. And then you have a perspective and understanding that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And then you have to bring those two together and you go, okay, well, God has given me the gift of today, which is going to be different than tomorrow. I need to enjoy it. Jesus says in John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal and destroy, but he's come to give us life in its fullness. Right now, today, Jesus gives you the offer for life in its fullness. When you come to him and understand that he, when he went on the cross, he died for you and for me, for the renewal of all creation, to make things right, to forgive sins when we bring them to him, when we have disobeyed him, when we have gone astray, so that not just we end up in heaven someday or something like that, something abstract that we don't fully understand, but so that we enjoy life in all of its fullness. When we resist change, when we are against change, we are missing out on that fullness of life because it only happens if we change. There's no way around it. God has ordained it. God has said there is a season for everything. He's inspired Solomon to write this for us. As Solomon observes the earth, he says, hey, you know what? There's sometimes where it's snowing. And there's sometimes it's not. And it turns out it's the same day in May. But hey, there are times when things change. Everything has its season. Everything has its time. God is constant. So, do your work. Do what you're meant to do. And enjoy it. Life can be enjoyed. Jesus came to give us life in all of its fullness. And if we are resistant to that, we just miss out. I want to keep going in this text, though, because there's some questions that are going to get answered in it. Questions like, well, if all these bad things are happening, why is that okay? Why is God okay with that? Because the author is going to keep going. And he's going to say, I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him, so that people have that healthy respect, understanding that God is God and I am not. Sometimes we go to God and say, God, why don't you do it my way? And God, in fact, actually says, you know what? You don't understand my way. I'm the creator of the universe. I'm the one who loves you. And not just loves you, loves everyone. So I've got a bigger picture, God is saying. And so we should have a healthy fear, respect, admiration for God. We shouldn't think of God as somebody we can control. God is God. We are not. So the author keeps going, whatever is has already been, and what will be has been before, and God will call the past to account. So everything that's happened will happen again. We know this. History repeats itself. The same way the seasons change, there's always going to be seasons. The same way, you know, we have experiences with people, that sometimes the past is a good indicator of a future experience. And I saw something else under the sun. In the place of judgment, wickedness was there. In the place of justice, wickedness was there. So this is what I was talking about before. We see all the bad things and go, why is it there? So the author is saying, you know, it should have been judgment. It should have been justice. But I still see wickedness. I still see human trafficking. I still see wars. I still see economic injustices. I still see pollution. I still see all these things that are wrong, God. I thought you loved us. You ever ask God that question? God, why are all these bad things happening? Why are children dying? Why is anyone dying? You know, God, if you can heal people, why don't you heal them? God, why did this person experience that? God, why is this person so horrible to me? And you go, and you don't understand it. We've all been there. There are lots of things that are not the way they're supposed to be. And we live in this weird tension. This tension of right now, we know 
that Jesus has offered us life in his fullness, that he has died for our sins, and he meant to renew all of creation. And the not yet of, well, creation is not renewed yet. And so things are still wrong. There's still pain. There's still sorrow. There's still tears. There's still injustice. There's still death. So we live in that weird tension of the now and the not yet. And so the author is saying this, saying, hey, every, everything has a time. Everything changes. You know, what do we gain from working so hard? Well, God has placed eternity in our hearts. He says, enjoy today. Because tomorrow, there's no guarantees. We don't know what it's going to be like. It's going to be different. So as everything changes every day. Just enjoy today. He says, well, I look around and some things are so awful. So awful. I said to myself, God will bring into judgment both the righteous and the wicked. And there will be a time for every activity, a time to judge every deed. The author says there's a time where God will bring that justice, that not yet we're waiting for. God will bring it. We don't understand it. We don't pick those times. We wish we could. But God will bring everything into judgment. He is in control. I also said to myself, as for humans, God tests them so that they may see that they are like the animals. Surely the fate of human beings is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Humans have no advantage over animals. Everything is meaningless. Again, mist. Everything is something we can't hold on to. We are born, we will die. We don't bring anything with us when we die. So as much as we work for things, as much as we try to gain stuff, he's saying, hey, it's all mist. One of the richest men in history says, hey, my beautiful palace, it's all mist. The gold in my sock drawer, it's all mist. Some people are experiencing it right now as stock market is going up and down and people are like, wow, I'm losing tons of money. It's all mist. That's hard to accept. But we can't hold on to it. All go to the same place, all come from dust, and all to dust, and to dust all return. Who knows if the human spirit rises upward and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth? So I saw that there was nothing better for a person than to enjoy their work, because that is their lot. For what can bring them to see what will happen after them? The author Ecclesiastes says this is true. Change happens. Change is inevitable. So what do we do? How do we approach it? How do we deal with it? The advice that's given from the author Ecclesiastes Solomon is this. Change will happen. Some will be bad. Some will be good. We will wonder why the bad is happening. We will wonder why the good isn't more, more good. But God is in control. And because God is in control, he will bring into judgment. He will make things right in time. So what do you do right now while you're waiting for those things to be made right? While you're wondering why things aren't right? While you're fighting with change? Enjoy life. Jesus came so you can have life in its fullness. Enjoy it. We have the choice when we encounter change, which we all do, every day, all the time, to either fight it or enjoy life. Doesn't mean that every change is good. Doesn't mean that every change is bad. But we all have to face change. How do we do that? Here's what my suggestion is. And this is what I get from Ecclesiastes. This is what I get from my own experience. And as someone who is a fan of change, I probably can't relate to some of you who struggle with it more. But this is what I know to be true, and I hope it will be a blessing for you as you face the changes that are going on all around you. Remember the God who doesn't change. Remembering is so key. We've said this before here at Bromley, and I'll say it again. Remember who God is. Remember how God has changed you. So you start with God. God is constant. Know God. Get closer to God. Keep getting closer to God. 
Read your scriptures, pray, worship through song, whatever it might be that helps you counter God, do it. Grow in your faith. Get to know the God who does not change. Get to know the God who holds change in his hands and is the one who will make everything right. So this is the second part of it. First is you get to know God. Second is enjoy life. If we spend our, all our time fighting something, we will not enjoy life. We will grow bitter. We will grow angry. When it becomes all about, I don't like this, I don't like this, this is wrong, it's about me, we miss out on that life and the fullness God offers us through Jesus. And we can only experience that life in the fullness when we allow that God who doesn't change to change us. We all need to be changed by God. And when we do, we can experience that life in the fullness he offers. So this you need to know. This I need to know. Change is guaranteed. Ready or not, things change. But even if you're not ready, God is constant. God is in control and God loves you. And because he loves you, he doesn't want you to stay the way you are. He wants you to get something more out of life. He desires for you to experience life in all of its fullness, which you can only do if you quit fighting change and embrace the God who doesn't change.